Hello, I'm Professor Goss. I am a real professor. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different. We're going to do some field work. I'm going to take you to one of my favorite places in the city of Chicago, the Chicago Electric Piano Company. Electric pianos are ancient artifacts that have since been replaced by digital replicas like this. However, there remains a small niche market of people who like their instruments to slowly break over time. Is this a Celeste? They're not paying me to be here today. My pursuit is entirely educational. So I'm going to sample some of these relics. But we'll also pop the hood and see a little bit of how these instruments work. What's happening? So join me as we take a trip to another time where if you wanted a new sound, you had to build it. Wiggling. Yeah, the low ones do that. <laughs> it's really wiggling. And they're wiggling in front of these. What are these things? Those are the, the pickups down there. What is a pickup? Uh, the pickup is a bunch of wire around the magnet. It's the same thing as like a guitar has. Um, for it uh, changes the electromagnetic field of the magnet. So the AC signal gets generated by that magnet and then amplified by the amplifier. It's just like an, a guitar. How many pickups does a guitar have? Well, it depends on the guitar. 73 on this one. Is the tone bar set to a certain pitch? They look like they are because they're bigger and smaller. The yeah. tone bar doesn't really produce a pitch. The tine and yeah, the tone bar. The tuning fork is, I guess, more like a Y. You know, it's going back and forth on yeah. each direction of the Y. And uh, the same thing is happening here between the tone bar and the tine. Okay. Okay. So why, but then why, if this isn't making a pitch, why is it so small? What's the significance of the size change? Uh, it's just like a changing, you know, like the, the resonating mass. This particular piano was made in the sixth week of 1977. Oh! Storage cabinet inside the keyboard. And what is So, it? I mean, this is the instrument, really. I mean, this thing is just mounted in that body. So, yeah, you're pushing in front of the arm. When you pull off, the yarn dampens the string again. Similar to like fretting a note on a guitar. Oh, so there's a string down. Oh, I see. There's a string down there. There's one string for every key? Yep. So when you press a key, the little hammer presses right there. Mm -hmm. With more precision than your finger here, but impossible. <laughs> Where's Honer from? Germany. 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 Um, so like the roads, it's vibrating parts that are amplified. As so you can see, the hammer is going to come up and strike, and then the reed is vibrating in between this pickup that's back there.
There's no tone bars on this instrument, right? No, it's just mounted on one side. And so that's why the, the Wurlitzer, if you're listening to it on a recording, it's always gonna have a quicker decay than a Rhodes that really rings out a lot more sustain. Ah, interesting. So because it, do, it lacks a tone bar, it doesn't have the sustain. I never thought about that. What's happening? So this thing is moving all the time and when you press a note it causes this wheel to go to, to move this tape and it also presses it onto the tape head with that thing. Each one of those is a tape head. Yeah. The magnetic information on the tape into sound or into electricity I guess first and then to sound. It's one long strip of tape. It gets pushed back into that metal box <laughs> and then these springs are pulling it back to reset it. And I don't know if anyone else will understand that but I, I get it now and that's the important thing. So there you have it. Ancient machines being brought back to life by these brave technicians. Thank you for watching my video, and I'll see you next time, probably somewhere in space. <laughs>